to give it a minute and allow the rest of our colleagues to join us and come on over from the route match session and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the new safety paradigm, Stories from the Field. I'm L'Oreal Lance, your Membership and Business Development Director, and I'm eager to introduce my colleagues and our panelists who will be sharing how they embraced new procedures, handled setbacks, and lessons learned from their communities. But before we get started, let's go through some Zoom housekeeping notes. So just like we've been doing in the other sessions, if you've been joining us, please ask questions in the Q&A feature only. You'll see that at the bottom right of your screen. Go ahead and start getting questions loaded in now. We know safety is a hot topic as it relates to COVID-19. So if you put them in now, we'll address them as we move throughout the session. And any question not answered will be answered live directly via email. Now I will allow my colleagues to introduce themselves, followed by our panelists. Great. Hello, and I guess it's afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex King, and I'm a senior program associate here at CTAA. And hi, everyone. My name is uh, William Reckley, and I'm a program associate here at CTAA. Hi, I'm Patricia Barnett Hale. I've been with Athens Transit for 34 years. We operate a system where we have 32 fixed route buses. We provide about 7,500. Um, trips per day. Um, we have 24 peak buses and we also provide paratransit services as well, complimentary paratransit. Hi, I'm Jill Drury. I'm from Charlevoix County Transit. I've been the manager here at Charlevoix County for uh, going on nine years now and I've been in working in county government uh, for 30 years come uh, July. So. Um, Charlevoix County Transit is a public transit countywide. We uh, service uh, 26,000 uh, residents in our county and uh, uh, we're a very tourist driven area. Uh, so we see a lot of ridership come from uh, those that are enjoying our area as well. We have 20 vehicles. We service a island that is 30 miles out uh, from the mainland in Lake Michigan and we have two vehicles out on that island. Hi, I'm Elaine Heiko, uh, Vermont Public Transportation Association. Uh, we work statewide with all the public transit providers um, across Vermont. Hi, I'm Jim Moulton. I've been uh, at Tri-Valley Transit for 19 years. Uh, we serve mid-Vermont, uh, the middle third of Vermont, which is about 2,400 square miles over two and a half counties. We have 40 buses and 60 volunteer drivers. Um, providing over 300,000 trips a year under normal conditions um, between our dial ride and our commuter and shuttle bus routes. Well, thank you all. So before we dive into how to best react to COVID, let's talk about pre-pandemic planning. So if I understand correctly, Pat, your system was ahead of the game. Do you mind sharing a little bit more about that? Sure. We actually developed a pandemic plan some time ago and for flu pandemic. So we were able to take that plan and also change it a little bit. So we were able to use it for this um, COVID-19, which was right on time. Uh, we got it in place. The plan actually covers how you sustain your operations. It makes you look at every function that you have going on. If you have two facilities, we were able to identify if we 
if we got to a present it, uh, uh, excuse me, if we got to a point in the service where we had 20% of our personnel were affected, what would we do? If you had 40%, what would you do? Can you still operate normal? Uh, you looked at your, and we went all the way to 60%, by the way. And we tried to figure out whether or not, who could work at home? We looked at our non-essential and our essential employees. Um, what would they need to work at home? One of those was that, that was one difficult part was some people, um, we had to, of course you run into a few stumbling blocks mm -hmm. because you had to figure out who needs VPN and all that kind of stuff. But because we had the pandemic plan in place, it was such a big help because it had, we got the pandemic plan in staff's hands in time so that everybody knew what they were supposed to do. So we didn't, that eliminated some of those phone calls. The drivers were able to look at the pandemic plan and they understood why, why, because some of those questions you get like, why am I working in their home? They, they understood why, because they were essential and emergency personnel. So they had a chance to look at that and see, oh, I'm essential, I get it. Now I'm kind of like the fire department of police officers. You know, they can't do it without me. Um, all the way down to the maintenance. We went so far as to identify how many buses would we run if we get to that certain percentage. If we lost this amount of personnel, okay, so how many buses would you still run? And then because we have this COVID, um, you need to eliminate how many buses you have out there. Because if you put them all, one, one big problem we had <laughs> was as people, we had some exposures. So we had to think about if you get those many exposures, like we talked about in percentages earlier, what are you going to do? What percentage of your service are you going to run? Are you going to run 16 buses? Are you going to run 19 buses? The pandemic plan was so thorough that we had, we actually get, took a look at every area of transit. So I would advise anybody that if you don't have a plan in place, and I could, this would take a long time to go through the entire pandemic plan, but I'll be happy to send this out to anyone that wants to look at it as a starting point, because we don't have a pandemic plan in place, go ahead and put one in place. It's gonna help you eliminate a lot of those phone calls and answer some of those questions ahead of time that people can ask. So we got a chance to get this out uh, like a week and a half before. So it was already in the staff's hands and we were able to get it to the management team. So the management team took it and actually used it for athens Clark County. They sent it out to everybody and said, hey guys, transit has this, let's use it. So everybody was able to take this template and use it as their own. So. Thank you so much, Pat. I'm sure that's exactly what our attendees wanted to hear. So yeah. if anyone would like access to Pat's um, road block, I guess, excuse me, <laughs> uh, path of how to best put together a, a pandemic plan, please email expo at ctaa.com. And after the event, we'll get that over to you. So now let's dig deep into personal protective equipment or as we've all learned to come to terms and calling it PPE, which I don't think most of us really were um, engaging in prior to COVID-19. So Jim, are face masks required for your drivers and for your passengers? If so, are you providing these? We can talk about enforcement in a few minutes. Sure, uh, when the uh, pandemic first started and our governor um, created a state of emergency, early on there was a, a an order contained in his uh, executive directives for um, workers, of uh, essential workers, people in the essential industries to wear face masks, but it was only suggested for um, customers, riders, anybody else. <clears throat> and our perspective on that was um, COVID-19 is a two-way transmission. And since the masks are intended to protect people, not the individual, but the other people, um, we felt it was imperative that uh, our riders need to be wearing masks as well. So we um, fought very hard, uh, you know, advocating for that change. And relatively uh, soon, within a couple of weeks, the governor actually made it an explicit mandate for transit riders, um, anybody using transit uh, vehicles, whether those were buses, whether those were um, anybody in volunteer cars who might still be able to maintain the six foot social distancing, that they wear masks. And that was critical in terms of, I think, a lot of things. One of the big ones being that uh, you don't want to have drivers who are driving and fearing um, for the people coming on that they may be at risk. Uh, and then having it as a, even as a company policy only, um, you can get into a lot of conflicts. And the last thing I think we need in the middle of a pandemic is more opportunities for conflict. So by getting the governor to explicitly state that, um, it 
created a very easy pathway for our drivers to feel safe and for the other riders to feel safe and to make it easy to deny um, rides or find alternative ways uh, for people to get those um, rides. So it was very critical for us, thanks. Thank you. So did you have to get creative in procuring these items, the PPE, or were you able to easily secure these items? Oh, I think just like everybody else around the country, it was incredibly easy to get PPE. And of course, I'm being sarcastic. Mm -hmm. um, we had our troubles just as anybody. Um, we were fortunate that uh, a lot of staff members um, and volunteers in the community were willing to actually sew cloth masks. Very early on, people jumped right in. Um, I can think off the top of my head of four or five different staff members, um, plus a couple of board members who immediately went uh, to their sewing machines and provided those masks for our staff first. Um, and we worked really hard with the state to coordinate how to get uh, adequate masks supplied. Ultimately, we ended up with, um, it's not exactly this, but for lack of a better term, pop-up boxes of masks so that we could put them on every vehicle and the riders as they came on, they could take one sealed mask if they needed it. Um, we found that most of the time, most people were coming on board with a mask, but if for any reason they didn't have it, then we had a way to supply it for them. Fabulous, thank you. Do any other panelists have anything to say about PPE in their communities? We're actually using, um, we're providing PPE to our passengers. We have, um, the bus operators are taking them out. We also ordered about 20,000 that we actually gave to the community. Um, it's for people that are not wearing masks. It's kind of, we can't hear, we couldn't make it mandatory, but we do inc strongly encourage. So. Thank you. So now let's move on to cleaning and sanitizing vehicles and facilities. All right. <laughs> so Pat, I know this is kind of your wheelhouse. So is your system ready if someone tests positive? Perhaps it's already happened. And what steps will you take or did you take? Right now that's handled by our risk department. We did have some exposures. We had some in-house. Uh, we haven't had anybody to test positive like on the bus or anything like that. If, if so, we wouldn't know anything about it. But for exposures, we have a process in place. Our risk management division definitely jumps on that right really fast. We developed some policies that came down. Um, oh my gosh, policies were coming down so quickly on how to handle it, what to do in 14 days. Um, I mean, these folks are on it here. I mean, we have an awesome, awesome team because we have our risk management team that they were so quick to get the information into the hands of each department. So we were able to pass that on to the operators and get it in their hands as quickly as we could. So they knew, don't come to work if you, if you have a call for fever. We, didn't, we had this in place before we even started doing the temperature checks. So they knew, they would just call in and say, hey, um, you know, I woke up, I'm coughing, I have a fever. And we would meet the witches say, okay, let's go ahead and get you, pull you, or you, you know, whatever the case may be. Or I had exposure to someone, they would uh, report it immediately. And once they reported it to us, we followed everything on the CDC. We also developed a website. And if you guys get a chance to go to Athens Clark County's website, we have a whole CDC page that just talks about COVID-19. So everything from anything you want to know, how to put the mask on, everything, and all our drivers and citizens had access to those, um, to, the, to the CDC website information. So because drivers were on buses, we also had to print off information. It was kind of easy to get them to embrace the idea of the mask um, and just piggyback on, on um, what Jim said a few minutes ago. But um, basically we were able to get them to embrace it because once they understood COVID, the information was coming out so fast and getting into the hands of it. You, in order to get someone to embrace what you're trying to do, they got to know why you're doing it. So that's what we figured out with all of this is when people are still saying why, then that's when we wind up with a problem. But as long as they understood, they jumped on it. They, the gloves were out. The masks were out. They were wearing them. Um, the vehicles, I know we're getting into that. I'll go ahead and say what I have to say about that one. We actually took, when we reduced our service, because the service was reduced, we had some extra drivers. Well, those drivers weren't going to have 40 hours. Well, they did because we took those drivers and sent them downtown to the multimodal center, had them wiping down buses every time they came in. So every time that bus came, every 30 minutes, every hour that bus got wiped down. 
We also took the additional uh, personnel and had them cleaning bus shelters. And uh, they actually, they would send in a report every night and say 30 shelters were wiped down, 30 shelters, but they were using fogging. I'll stop right there and let somebody else say. <laughs> Before we move forward, apparently the attendees are very eager to learn a little bit more about your system, generally where you are. I think maybe Pat saying that it wasn't mandatory in her area kind of got people a buzz. So yeah. if you can once again state your city state and how many cases are in your area, I think it'll give the attendees a little bit of an easier way to kind of frame where you're coming from. So we'll start with you, Pat, and then we'll, we'll continue on. I'm in Athens, Georgia. And what's the other, I'm sorry, I missed one of the questions. How many cases you're having in Athens or in Georgia in general? Oh, uh, how, how many? Yes. Exposures? Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, well, last time I checked, we had, oh my gosh, the last check was 2,000. We had around 2,000 exposures. Um, we've only had 113 deaths, okay. but there was around 2,000 exposures, yeah. And this is in Athens proper? This is in Athens, yes. And Jill? Hi, I'm from Northern Michigan. So if you're looking at your uh, hand, right hand, we're at the top of your ring finger. Um, so we're away from the hot spots in Michigan. Uh, we've only had 15, 16 cases reported as of um, Sunday. Uh, and we've had one death um, in our county um, in the service area that we have. Um, so it's been difficult um, in ways for agencies up here to uh, get folks to take things seriously just because they're not seeing the numbers like we would see in the more metropolitan um, and densely populated areas. Um, as far as the cleaning and the sanitizing, a couple of the things that we did, um, we, like many agencies, um, had to limit our service. We actually only have four vehicles on the road a day right now. Uh, so uh, it's very easy for us to make sure that those vehicles are clean at the end of the day. One of the things that we did scheduling wise was put that vehicle out on the road all week long. And because primarily the drivers were using the same vehicle, um, even though we had a couple different drivers doing shifts, we scheduled um, each driver to their own vehicle for the full week um, to cover the shifts uh, throughout the week. And then that way the drivers knew how well those vehicles were being maintained for cleaning purposes. Um, they weren't fearful of getting into a vehicle that hadn't been cleaned well by the person that had driven before them, um, which really helped um, in giving them uh, a sense of um, security. Uh, and as far as the cleaning and uh, sanitizing of the vehicles, the dri our drivers are cleaning seats and handrails every chance that they get anytime uh, they've got a few minutes between passengers and then we're doing a deeper clean when those vehicles come in at night. Um, we have just finally been able to order UV lights and uh, those should be delivered this week and we'll be starting to do UV light um, disinfecting. Uh, with all of our vehicles um, on a nightly basis uh, once uh, we have those on hand for us as well. Thanks, Jill. Does the UV light come with a, a training person or is that something your, your staff is going to kind of have to figure out on their own? So it, it's really quite easy. Um, the company came in and took a look at the vehicles to determine the amount of space that needs to be treated. Um, they, the lights could be either hung um, using a bracket type system, um, which would require putting some kind of a bracket in, in the top of the roof of the buses. Um, in our cutaway buses, we run all cutaways or raised roof um, bands. Uh, right now, we are only using our cutaways just because that gives us the opportunity to uh, do better social distancing uh, with our vehicles and with the number of passengers on board. Um, but the, the um, salesperson and their staff came in and looked at our vehicles to determine the number of lights that would be needed and how to position those. Um, and so they can either be hung or they can be put on a tripod um, and then set down the aisle. Um, for our buses, our cutaways that we'll be using, they're 16 passenger buses, and we're going to use three lights per bus. Um, and it's a five-minute application um, at most, depending on the amount of space that you're covering. 
Uh, so you close the door and hit a remote control and it will start the light. Um, once they turn back off, you can go in, move those lights from one vehicle to the next vehicle and start the process over again. The nice thing about having them on the tripod is that we can take those vehicle, uh, those lights into our office area and also then sanitize or disinfect the office areas. Um, with the lights, uh, some of our areas are going to be too large where three lights won't effectively do it, but those areas are, are like our conference room where there's not as much um, uh, foot traffic through those, but in our offices that are being um, used every day, one or two lights will effectively do um, the, the disinfecting that we need uh, with that process. Um, the UV light doesn't take away from the daily wipe down cleaning that you need to do. It's just a second layer or another layer of uh, disinfecting. That's great. Thank you. And it sounds like you're doing it very efficiently by moving the light also into your office space. Yep. So Jim, I'll allow you to restate where you are along with the number of cases in your area. Sure. So I'm in Vermont. Um, we cover the middle of the third of the state going from top to bottom. So um, for anybody who knows anything about Vermont, the largest uh, municipality is Burlington, which is in the northwest. Um, Vermont's a very rural state, one of the most rural in, in the country. So um, across our 2,400 square miles, we have about 65,000 um, residents. So it's not high density population. Um, there are probably in our region, um, a little over around 100 cases, only 100 cases, um, and fewer than 15 deaths. Um, but I think, you know, one of the reasons that people have been uh, willing to be relatively um, compliant with the directives, et cetera, is that, you know, Vermont's a relatively small state. It's easy to move around for people if they wanted to. And um, even with stay-at-home directives, I think uh, people just felt very committed to um, compliance to keep the exposures down. Um, but I think people have been very committed to enacting all the protocols, you know, every last piece of PPE that could be enacted, every last practice that could be enacted. Um, like the others, you know, we've been uh, having our drivers sanitize vehicles as frequently as possible. We've put in other um, things like shower curtains um, as people board the bus uh, so that the drivers and the passengers are separated. The drivers can scroll that back when they're driving so they aren't, um, don't have um, sight line issues. Um, we were even having drivers um, when they parked uh, or when they went to pick people up, they would stop the vehicle and step out to allow passengers to come on before we got those um, installed. Um, We've taped off seats to make sure social distancing um, occurs, uh, you know, keep people at least six feet apart when they're on the buses. Um, and one of the biggest things we did also is we moved away from our regular scheduled routes and went to ride reservation only so that every rider had to call in and be screened. Um, they'd be asked all the screening questions um, where, you know, where they'd been, um, were they going for essential trips, et cetera, et cetera, and to make sure that we didn't overbook our buses and or we could redeploy the number of vehicles to the right places to make sure we were keeping um, up with whatever demand there was. Thank you. And Elaine, we'd love to hear from you about who you are and how many cases in your area. Hi, so um, I can speak about Vermont as a whole state, um, we have a total of 1,075 cases with a total of 55 deaths statewide. Um, so those are the numbers that I'm able to provide to you guys today. Thank you. You're welcome. And Alex, I believe there's a question about drivers calling in sick. Yeah, so I will start with that one and then I'll turn it over to Will for a couple of the other questions that have come in. Um, so a, a while back, we got two questions coming in wondering about all of your responses with regards to challenges you may have had with operators desiring to stay home due to potential virus exposure um, and how you're handling that um, if they're calling out sick or if, you know, what concerns um, they've raised and, and I guess just how you've handled it. Um, I don't know if anyone in particular would like to start or has handled that themselves. Yeah, go ahead, Jen. So um, we had a handful of drivers who did express that they felt they were high risk candidates either due to age or an underlying condition. Um, we honored that uh, either by 
offering alternate work, um, as um, has been previously described. Uh, I think Pat mentioned that they were having some drivers do alternate work. Um, if people did have to stay home, then we honored that as well. Um, we were fortunate that under the CARES Act funding, we could keep people whole financially during this time period and not uh, overstress uh, their individual economic situations. Um, and for you know many of our drivers, um, what was critical was knowing that we had taken this seriously, that we had were implementing every possible safety protocol, and <coughs> we were providing them with the proper PPE, training them on the proper PPE, and consistently looking to implement any new ideas that came along. So, you know, every day, every week, if some we heard something new, um, learned something new, we would implement that and communicate that with them and train them on it. I think that provided just a very high degree of confidence in the drivers that we were really looking out for their best interests. Um, I certainly know that when we, um, you know, worked with the governor to get face mask mandated, that sent a very strong message to our drivers that um, we cared about them and cared about their safety. And um, I think that is probably in some ways the most important thing we could have done is, is to consistently show that we were looking to do everything we could for them. Thank you. And I have a question that came in on my end as well for anyone. Because transmission of the virus seems to be largely airborne, how are you handling vehicle airflow and filtering? Windows down. Anyone else operating with all windows down, doing not turning on the AC in general, no heat if, you're, if your area still needs heat in the day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've done the same thing. The drivers, many of our drivers are opening up windows so that they've got some air moving through so it's not um, as stagnant in the vehicles and we're not using the, the, air C, uh, the AC right now, if at all possible. And Will, I believe you had a few questions. Yeah, so this is going back to uh, kind of the UV light with Jill and Elaine, you might even be able to answer this or speak to it a little bit, but for the smaller vehicles, are you finding that the UV light works well there? Is, or do you know like the traditional methods of disinfecting might be easier given the size of the vehicle? We only looked at our um, cutaways when we had the company come out and look at the UV light. Um, it really depends on the amount of shadows that you get um, in the vehicle when you place the light in it as far as how well it's going to uh, work. Uh, so in a small vehicle, depending on, on the layout of it, probably one light would work in something like an MV1 um, or a minivan, whereas um, a, a raised roof, um, like off of our uh, Ford Transits, probably are still gonna need two lights just because you get those shadows around the seats. Um, and that's why we're doing three with our cutaways. Um, because of shadows, uh, we needed to, to place a third light down through the aisle to make sure that we were getting all areas. Um, again, it's, it's definitely not a, the only way to, to disinfect. Um, this is just another layer um, definitely want folks to still be wiping everything down um, as much as they can. And then this is done either in the evening or in the morning before those vehicles go out. And I do have the contact information that I can pass along. Thank you. That's been requested. I'm sure you knew that, Jill. Yep. <laughs> um, so this one's for everyone. What is the one thing that's been most pivotal pivotal in cleaning your vehicles. I know we've heard about disinfecting in general, like wipes and Clorox and other things. We've heard about UV lights, but is there one thing that the panelists believe everyone should be doing with their vehicles? I think regular, consistent cleaning is the most important thing. Um, I think it was Jill that mentioned having drivers do it at any time between passengers. That's what we've tried to do as well. I know that you know a lot of urban systems when they started out were doing things like every three days we're disinfecting our vehicles. I think that gave zero confidence to the riders and to the operators that that was safe. You know, it's like so it's it's infected for three days and I'm supposed to feel okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we implemented right away. Just you know, it had to be 
not just every day, but after every shift. So if a vehicle was used more than once, that every shift it was being um, done. And then we strongly encouraged the drivers between every passenger to, you know, any part of the vehicle that they could disinfect. It didn't have to be, you know, an entire disinfection every single time, but handrails, seats, you know, steering wheel, um, all the common places, just regularity, I think. Thank you. Has anyone heard directly from passengers what would most alleviate their concerns, assuming they have to ride one way or another, and you're doing your best with disinfecting? Is there something else that they're communicating where they say, I'd really love to see this, that would make me feel safe? Yes, Pat. Well, I was just going to say, we haven't gotten that question, but one of the things that we did have a concern about, one of our big concerns was on the lift, on our, we call it the lift, our paratransit. I was just going to say to everybody, please be really careful there because we actually added extra PPE for those passengers and um, when, when transporting those passengers. And also, um, that's you're a little more at risk, uh, the, the drivers as well as the passenger because their immunity level is so low. So when those buses are cleaned at night, we make sure that those doors are closed and try to, you know, you, all doors need to be closed anyway once you clean that vehicle. But um, just pay special attention to your paratransit vehicles, those sorts of more at risk because of diabetes and other underlying conditions. Yes, we're going to touch on paratransit just a bit. Thank you, Pat. Will, any additional questions? Um, so the last thing is just, have you guys used, I know the CDC came out with their guidelines a couple of weeks ago. Um, have you guys used those at all? Have you gone above and beyond to try to prove how safe your systems are at using that as like a baseline? I'm just curious if you guys have used those to inform your decision making at all. Yes, we have. One, one of the things we've done, Will, is, is create posters and try to put them on the buses. Um, put little diagrams with, you know, a person with a mask on, just trying to constantly communicate and get the same message out there that we are doing these protocols, we are trying to keep everyone safe so that people sort of are able to maintain their confidence in the system. And it's just a consistent message over and over. It's almost like advertising your safety. I think it's important. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wanna, um confirm or, you know, emphasize what Elaine just said, you know, we've got decals on the outside of buses that have little smiley faces with masks on them, you know, just to remind people to mask up. You know, we have the, the screening um, checklist right on the doors as people enter to self-screen, you know, do they have any of the symptoms, um, you know, things like that. So I think, you know, we, we are, like Elaine said, trying to communicate as much as possible with our riders, with our, um, staff over and over and over because the more we communicate the more it becomes just reinforced um behavior and uh but i think that's um that's the critical element one of the things that we used was our alerting system um so in the the two sessions earlier from um eco lane and route match they talked about having um, a notification system and we have route match and we have that notification system. And so we utilize that and as um, folks are calling in and setting up rides, um, whether they're longtime passengers or new passengers, we're going in and making sure that we've got them set up on the notification so that they're either receiving a call the night before to remind them of what time their, their trip is the next day or they're getting the call the same day to let them know that the bus is on its way in 20 minutes. Um, so using that notification system, we added a message right into the notification system, reminding them that they had to utilize a, um, a mask when coming on our vehicles. Um, and that's been helpful. Um, that's really cut down uh, the interaction with our, our passengers and our drivers as far as folks not coming on board with masks. We still have a few. Um, but that's helped us uh, tremendously because it's a reminder that they're getting um, and they're hearing it every time they book a trip. Thank you, Jill. This is a great reminder that we're gonna have a communication session tomorrow afternoon. And I think a lot of your hot questions regarding how to communicate to drivers, to passengers and everyone in between will be covered there as well. So let's move on to social or physical distancing. And we're gonna hear first from Jill and Jim. 
So what strategies have you implemented for increased physical distancing between drivers and passengers and just between passengers as well? I'll jump in first. One of the, the first things that we did, um, our, here in Michigan, we started seeing um, changes and cancellations about mid-March. Um, so as soon as, as we started having these cancellations due to COVID, uh, the schools and, um, and such were mid-March, uh, the third week of March is when our stay at home order came out. Uh, we immediately changed our, our service protocols. And um, uh, one of the things that we did was um, because we lost so many of the contracts because of everything closing because of the stay at home contracts, um, that, that really brought us down to, to four vehicles a day. We were doing one vehicle in each community and one doing medical transportation for dialysis. I, I take that back five because we have the one out on Beaver Island as well. Um, so with five vehicles out on the road, um, it was uh, real easy for us to be able to um, manage our ridership because we were telling folks that they could only use the service for essential rides. Um, you know, if they were just going to a location that might be some type of a recreation type trip or something, we were basically saying, no, if you're not going for shopping for groceries, if you're not going to a doctor's appointment, or you know, if you're not going to work, you know, those are the only trips we're doing. So that was one of the first steps that we took. Um, we pretty much have, have limited the number of uh, folks on the bus. We're doing one-off trips. Um, just to maintain that social distancing so that, you know, that we're not having a problem. Um, at most on our 16 passenger vehicles, we're doing four folks on, on, a, on a trip at a time. So four passengers, we've, we've, all of our vehicles or the majority of our vehicles are all seats that can be stowed, um, the flip down so that we can open up that vehicle to, to maximize it for wheelchair capacity if we ever need it. Um, so we've folded seats so that they can't utilize them um, that way instead of, you know, saying don't sit in on the spot where there's an X, we've just folded the seats away and so that the seats aren't even available. Um, and we went out and measured to see, you know, what six foot apart would look like and to be able to determine, you know, what our capacity would be at six foot apart. So when a lot of folks were going to 50% capacity on, you know, on buses, we, we took it right down to, to the minimum and took the six foot real seriously. And so we're at four passengers and we plan on maintaining that for quite a while. As long as social distancing um, is being recommended, we will continue on with that. Um, with wheelchairs, then that takes, um, you know, the, the number of ambulatory passengers down um, on the vehicle um, more because of the space that a wheelchair would take. Uh, one of the things that we did provide for our drivers um, back to some PPE was face shields. Um, and we didn't mandate that the driver use the face shield. We, we highly recommend it to them, um, provide them to them, and then um, based on their comfort level, uh, whether they felt like they needed to use a face shield or not, um, when they were um, securing wheelchairs, then uh, that was up to the driver. Um, they're, they're the ones who are interacting with these passengers on a daily basis. Um, for the most part, the, the passengers that we were transporting that were wheelchair bound were people that were going to dialysis appointments. And so they're longtime customers that we know. And so the drivers know them well. And, and so they, uh, they, some of them were comfortable with not using that extra layer of PPE, and some of them wanted that extra layer of PPE. And Jim, any thoughts on social distancing on the vehicle? Yeah, so uh, uh, I, I've got actually sort of eight things that I, I noted down. One was that when the um, first day of emergency was enacted, um, everything was limited to essential trips, so dialysis, cancer, methadone, those kinds of things. By doing that um, dramatically reduced the ridership. So created some 
uh, space to, to do that. Second, as I mentioned earlier, um, the ride reservation system. By having people call in, we knew that we could keep the numbers down on any particular vehicle. And it also provided the opportunity for our dispatchers to screen everybody, to make sure that A, they knew that they had to wear a mask, B, that they passed the criteria, no symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we taped off seats. Um, you know, we don't happen to have buses with every individual seat. <laughs> That's a great little system, but um, you know, we taped them off. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, early on, we were also having the drivers, as they picked people up, they would stop the bus, they would step out, create that social distance. Um, we then put in the curtains. One of the early things we also did was to um, eliminate fare collections on all of our vehicles. Um, I think that became a common practice soon after. Um, and then uh, we also, um, similar to uh, what Jill just described, in terms of uh, going one-on-one, -on -one, um, we do a lot of our rides through volunteer drivers under normal conditions. Early on with social distancing, that wasn't possible unless they had a, a vehicle with three rows. So if they did, we would allow passengers to ride three rows back with masks on. Um, Otherwise, we put those people on individual buses and we would sign them individual drivers to minimize the number of uh, contacts with people. Um, as, as, the, uh, as we've been opening up, as the state has been opening up and allowing more things, um, we have passengers who go in volunteer vehicles sit uh, you know, the driver's in the driver's seat, the passenger is in the opposite corner. Um, we provide the volunteer drivers with sanitizing um, PPE. We have them um, sanitize the vehicle in front of the rider before the rider gets in. Um, so, uh, and the, the newest thing that we're investigating, um, uh, Vermont has begun to open up a little bit further and allowing some closing of the social distance. Um, for example, allowing some, what they call sort of contact sports, like soccer or lacrosse, or things. like people can gather in small groups and play as long as they don't have constant con uh, contact. So we've been looking at putting up barriers between rows of seats, um, but we measured um, one window seat to the other, and you can get five and a half feet nose to nose, which is almost six feet. Um, under this new protocol, we may be able to say, now we can increase the, the volume on our buses back to 50%. So rather than two passengers on the left aisle and two passengers on the right aisle, you get one and one in the window seats, you're far enough apart, and you keep the rows separate from each other by putting up um, plexiglass or things like that. And we've been working with bus manufacturers um, to make sure that those are meeting safety protocols. Great, thank you. I wanna to touch on funding since Jim already touched on it. Has anyone else changed their payment structure? Maybe you've eliminated fares or maybe you went totally at base and if the person didn't have that application, they weren't able to ride. I would love to hear a little bit more about that as we understand that the capacity issue also relates directly to funding. Yeah, we went, um, we went fare free right away. So back mid-March, um, even before the stay at home order uh, was out when things started canceling, um, we knew that we were going to see uh, passengers who were gonna um, have financial issues, you know, frankly. Um, we're, we're a tourist resort area. And so we're very hospitality driven. And so with restaurants closing and um, our tourist area um, just going down to nothing. We knew right away that, you know, even a dollar or two dollar, three dollar fare, um, it wouldn't take long and that would become difficult for people. So right away, mid-March, we, we took our fares right down to free fares for everything. Um, and we're continuing that at this time. Um, uh, we're going to talk, my board meets again tomorrow, we're going to talk about post-COVID and what things will look like as we move forward. Obviously, COVID isn't done, but you know, what are we going to do over the coming three months, six months, year? Um, how do we handle fares? Um, do we still want to be cash-free? Um, we do have um, the pay app, um, or the pay program that... Um, uh, was mentioned during the last session uh, with route match. So we, we have that ability for folks to use. Um, we also are looking at another application that could be used, uh, a mobile ticketing um, application that could easily be used um, just to try to help um, stay away from cash as much as possible. Thank you. 
And is anyone not requiring social distancing on their vehicles? Pat, I know you're in a slightly different neck of the woods than everyone else. So I was curious to know if you you guys are still requiring it or if you've kind of let up on it and, and are hoping that folks wear masks. No, we're still requiring social distancing. What we've done is so we, a couple of things we've done is stopped uh, loading from the front. We load from the rear and that helped with the driver. Um, we also, reduce the amount of passengers. We actually put some policies in place that require parents to ride with children to uh, avoid having the joy riding. We uh, actually started the essential trips only. So if there were children out there riding, parents had to be there with them if they weren't going to work or you know, had some reasons for mm -hmm. you know, travel. Because uh, one of the problems we had, we had a lot of you know, school kids out. So they had nothing to do. So what they were doing was just jumping on the buses and riding. So we had people like, during COVID, we were still carrying around 3,000 trips a day. And, and this is on, like I see at that point, we were running eight buses. So those, that's a fully loaded bus. So we had some serious issues. So that's why we had to put those policies in place. And we did, we, we had some issues there. Thank and you. I know we lightly touched on it earlier about um, changing staff roles throughout this crisis. How has everyone had the, disins the um, disinfecting and the cleaning happening? Who's doing that? Is that your maintenance team? If so, what training were they provided, if any? Well, for us, it was our uh, maintenance department. We have a facility uh, maintenance person at our multimodal center. And so they spearheaded it. And then we had some community service workers for a little while. But then we had to, uh, we, we stopped using community service workers as that was kind of putting them at risk as well as everybody else at risk because we actually closed down our um, multimodal center so that no one was able to come in. So we, all doors were secured. So no one was coming inside the facilities at one point. So uh, they had porta potties uh, at the uh, multimodal center for uh, people that were boarding at the multimodal center. Um, so that's kind of the direction we went and that kind of stuff. But um, we had people already in place that were actually over anyone that was going to be doing the cleaning. Bus shelters, we had a maintenance team already that was responsible for cleaning shelters. So they were the ones that were sort of overseeing anybody else. If there were drivers that we had additional you know, personnel and we could use those, then we had the maintenance uh, supervisors. They were supervising them to make sure nobody got hurt or anything and chemical use. Thank you. Anyone else had used a different method? All right, let's move on to passenger assist assistance and securement concerns. We know this is a very sensitive topic. We've already touched on it lightly, but Jim and Jill, have you changed any of your policies when it comes to interacting with passengers in wheelchairs? And if so, how are you balancing safety concerns? So, um, I would say this was one of our early um, big worry points. Um, obviously with wheelchair securement, you have to be less than six feet apart. So um, we wanted to make sure that uh, our drivers especially, but the riders as well felt as protected as possible. <coughs> um, if, if any riders um, were able to have a personal care attendant come along, whether that was a family member or somebody else, um, we uh, strongly encourage that to make sure that they could um, uh, have a support system and, and that person could do as much of the um, protocols as possible. Um, but then we also worked to make sure that our drivers um, had additional uh, PPE. Um, I forget whether it was Jill or Pat uh, who specifically talked about um, additional PPE, but we got protective gowns for mm -hmm. our drivers to wear. And we basically provide them with four gowns for each transport. One when they're loading the passenger initially, one when they're um, unloading the passenger at their destination, and then you know two more for reversing that. Um, we not only made sure that they had masks and that the rider had masks, but we also provide face shields um, as a double protection on top of that. Um, plenty of gloves to make sure that they can, you know, take them on, put them on and take them off as often as possible. Um, hand sanitizer, um, you know, we try to make that as available as possible. Um, and we make sure that that's available on the buses for passengers as well. That was a big uh, um, desire by passengers to feel safer. Um, so, and then, you know, uh, just making sure that basically the drivers were as completely protected as possible and minimizing the contact 
um, and, pro and asking for support systems when possible. Thank you. Jill? Yeah, we, um, like Jim had said, we used the, the PPE, upped our, our PPE for the drivers, made sure that the gloves were available. Um, uh, a lot of the things that, that Jim mentioned were doing the same thing. We were real fortunate. We had um, a, um, a local company who was, uh, who was making skis, custom skis, and they turned around within a, a couple weeks time and started making face masks. Um, and so they were not only delivering those and donating those to the local hospital and, and doctor's offices, um, but they made them available to our um, sheriff's department through the emergency management program. And so we were able to source a lot of our PPE right through the emergency, emergency management program um, with those face shields being one of the things that, uh, that we got. Um, a lot of uh, distilleries in the area and across the, the nation have been uh, ramping up in, in making hand sanitizer. And we were able to utilize um, uh, a couple local distilleries to be able to uh, get extra hand sanitizer, uh, just because the gel sanitizer was so hard to get um, and still is at times, we were able to um, supplement by having um, the the more liquid sanitizer um, available um, and put it in spray bottles and made sure that the drivers at least had that type of a hand sanitizer um, when we didn't have the gel available to us. Uh, most of, because we had so few cases in our area, um, again, most of our folks felt fairly safe, even though we were taking it seriously. Um, you know, there, there wasn't the level of concern, I guess you might say, as what um, in a more metropolitan area um, was seeing, you know, we, our, our folks felt safe without having the extra barriers around their driver compartment. Um, we offered that to them and at that time they, they still felt safe enough that they felt with the PPE we were offering them that that was, um, and their ability to get out of their seat and clean after every passenger um, or every couple passengers was enough to keep them feeling comfortable in their job that they weren't worried. Um, but we did what we could to make sure that um, they had all the tools available to them. Thank you. So the team has alerted me that we have a few questions as it relates to this topic. So I'll allow the team to jump in and share those. Yeah, so I guess I'm curious if you guys had to go through any additional trainings for your drivers. I know we're going to touch on that in a second for other topics, but just in as it relates to PPE in specific uh, in securement scenarios, if you had to do any additional trainings or anything like that, if there was any additional complexities that gowns or, or face shields might add to the scenario? Yes, we um, had uh, used CDC videos in terms of um, showing, making sure that people knew how to put masks on appropriately, take them off appropriately, you know, not, you know, minimizing contact, all of that. Same thing with gowns. Um, we had our staff trainer you know, review everybody, make sure that they had had the training, understood every element of it, um, and created a checklist and, uh, you know, sort of had our own internal certification process to make sure that they knew how to, uh, what all the protocols were and how to, how to do them appropriately. Thank you. And I think that was it. Nope, that was it, L'Oreal. All right. Hi, L'Oreal. Sorry, I had another one. Um, and this is actually just one that I've been talking to a few people about. So Pat, I'm curious, because you had mentioned that you've been doing rear boarding um, as a way to help with some of the physical distancing on your buses. Yeah. But I'm curious because for a lot of vehicles, the lifts are in the front door. Um, so I'm curious how you kind of manage some of these passenger assistance and securement when that can sometimes not align with the other policies um, put in place for COVID. Lift passengers are still using the front door. All passengers with disabilities are still using the front doors because we only have ramps on the front. Great, thank you. 
So let's move on to another very, very sensitive topic. And I know every agency has handled this differently, but let's talk about transporting COVID-19 positive patients. Elaine, I know that this is your whale house. Have you been transporting every, anyone who's COVID positive? What are your practices in accepting and denying riders? So we are so fortunate in Vermont that we do not directly transport folks who are COVID positive or anyone who is actually exhibiting any symptoms of COVID-19. So Vermont might be a little different in that respect. However, we utilize a screening questionnaire that was developed with the Vermont Department of Health and it's used prior to scheduling each trip. And the way that works is when a rider doesn't essentially pass the questionnaire, they're referred to our office, to the VPTA staff for a deeper dive. Um, and we do a more thorough risk assessment on those people with the insurance for them that they will get a ride, but it may be um, in a different mode of transport than what they're used to. And what that looks like, as long as the ride is confirmed essential, we can reach out to the provider and confirm that if we have any suspicions that they might be COVID positive or they're exhibiting symptoms, um, then we conduct some level of risk assessment to, with the Department of Health um, as needed to determine the appropriate um, level of risk and then do the ride request uh, if possible on public transit. And if not, um, what we do is we um, schedule rides in a non-emergent ambulance, um, which is funded through the state of Vermont um, as a different revenue source. And we're able to, you know, that way keep public transit incredibly safe, um, still assure anyone and everyone that they'll get a ride if they're exhibiting symptoms. Um, and that's been real reassurance for not only the passengers on public transit, but also our drivers as well. Would you say that you've had a number of cases where your team needed to do another deep dive into the situation if the person didn't pass the initial set of questions? So yes, in the beginning, it was quite a few folks. Um, now the, the landscape is shifting a little bit. So we're actually, um, we're more comfortable knowing when somebody answers a question like, yes, I have been in contact with someone who has COVID-19, but I'm a healthcare worker. We know risk assessment for healthcare workers is really, really low because they have had PPE all along. They are checked at work every day. <laughs> they self-screen themselves. So those kind of things, we're, we're, we're sort of becoming more professional in these areas. Mm -hmm. um, we are doing the deeper dives, uh, but we're also now in Vermont providing, um, you know, asymptomatic pop-up testing. So that's like a whole nother level. We want to make sure that anyone's going to for these um, pop-up tests that they're not um, exhibiting any symptoms. So they have to be screened as well. And again, some of the questions um, require a deeper dive because some of them work in healthcare. Some people, you know, live over the border and come into Vermont every day. So we utilize the questionnaire pretty heavily every day, even if someone's a, you know, very frequent flyer, they're getting the question every time before they arrive. So to be clear, your team is driving folks to the pop-up testing sites? We do, as long as they're asymptomatic. So okay. that's only for people who are not exhibiting any symptoms at all. Um, and sometimes, um, it's hard to believe people are less than honest about that, and they would just like to get a ride to pop-up testing. So we're working really hard um, to, to make certain that that doesn't happen, and on occasion, um, we, we get somebody who tests positive and then we take appropriate steps with that. Um, that was my yeah. question. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Anyone else transporting COVID-19 positive patients? All right, Alex has alerted me that we have two great questions that just rolled in. Awesome. Yeah, so one of the questions was, with all the stress placed on the health departments in your communities, during this time, how responsive have they been when you call with a concern about a COVID-19 passenger? I know, Elaine, you're working on the state level, um, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but anyone else as well on, on the local level with this question? Well, for us, um, we talk to the, the Vermont Department of Health every day. Um, we're in contact, they're reaching out to us. We're, we're having great communication with them. Um, that might not be the case for other, other folks, but um, we've been really lucky to partner with them and they've been very, very supportive of our efforts and our concerns. And you know, um, we feel very 
very lucky to have this type of partnership with them during COVID. It's really, really made the transition to, to changing the way we operate much easier. Yeah, and if I could piggyback on what Elaine just said, um, when we've had to have individual interactions with them, they've been very responsive. Um, whether it's, you know, an employee saying, I'm experiencing symptoms, what do I do? Um, immediate, one of the things that I think has been strong with our um, Department of Health is the contact tracing. You know, they've been very quick to say, okay, you know, make sure you interview the person, find out who they've been in contact with, find out what they've been doing over the last couple of days, so that everybody's prepared if the, a test comes back positive. Um, we've been fortunate that none of the tests uh, in our region have come back positive, but for the, you know, up to, you know, somewhere between eight and 10 tests that have, have occurred in, in the early days, they were very responsive in guiding us and very responsive in, in setting us up for success if something did happen. Alex, you had another one? Uh, yeah, I think Pat had one more comment before I moved to the next oh. question. I was just going to say, we had great experience with public health as well. We've had them attend, our, actually attend our meetings um, with the commissioners. So to get information out to the public. So it's been really good. And also, I want to change the stats. So I gave you guys the wrong stats. I want to make sure Georgia has had 50,000 exposures and 2,000 deaths. Athens has had 325 exposures and only 15 deaths. So just wanted to clear that up. Yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, and L'Oreal, there's two more questions. So I'll take one now and then we can move to our last couple sure. topics. And then if there's enough time, we can do the other one afterwards. Um, so this one is Elaine for you and it's asking, for Vermont, um, the system where you ha you said non-emergency ambulances are being funded to do these transit trips for COVID positive, was that arrangement kind of predated before COVID or did kind of it newly developed in response to all of this? If you could give any other insights on that, I think we have a couple people that are curious. So it, it wasn't pre-COVID. Um, once COVID began and we knew that we were going to have some instances when people were going to obviously fail the questionnaire, they were trying to find a way to actually dispatch all these um, non-emergent ambulances that they had contract, subcontracted with to provide the rides. Um, and VPTA was able to step up and say, look, you know, our staff is available and ready and able to assist you in, in doing this. So we became that, um, you know, 800 number to call when there was a problem. Um, and again, it, it worked out really well because then when our public transit providers had somebody that, you know, wasn't able to essentially pass that questionnaire, we could give them that reassurance that not to worry, we're going to get you to the test. We're going to get you where you need to go. Um, and, and that really worked out really well for us. And, uh, and I should mention that now the non-ambulance rides are almost non-existent to the fact that we actually go to the person's house now. We don't bring them to a testing site. Those non-emergent ambulances go to do the test directly at the person's home. So there's less exposure all around. So th things have changed in the past couple of months. I, I guess evolved is a better word. Thank you. I had a question on this side as well. Is everyone temp checking their staff and or passengers daily or maybe not the passengers and just the staff? How are you handling that? We're testing our drivers. Yeah, yeah. We have a self self assessment form that each uh, individual who comes into our building has to fill out. So as staff arrive every day, um, we have the touchless thermometer, and they have to um, fill out the form indicating if they've traveled, if they've been. Um, in contact with anybody that's been COVID positive and then all of the other health questions that are asked. Um, so they're self-assessing and then providing that, um, uh, that information back to me before uh, they go out on the road or go to their desk to, to work every day. Um, and we're hanging on to all of that information just in case the health department or anybody else needs it. So um, yeah, we're doing it. We're not testing our, our uh, passengers. Jill, would you be able to share that self-assessment with the sure. group? Sure. Thank you. All so, right, Alex and Will, it looks like we can move on unless anyone else has anything to say. So, a fun one, or at least if you ask me. 
Managing conflict and de-escalation skills for employees. We know this is very important as we work through all of the reopening phases that all of the states seem to have. So Pat and Elaine, how will you enforce mask and or social distancing or is this something that your systems will not be doing? Uh, so Pat, do you want me to take this one? Okay, so thankfully we have an addendum in place since May 1st that requires face coverings for all public transit, um, our stations and our terminals. Um, so when a rider refuses to wear a mask, they don't really, they don't receive a ride. Um, so that's, that's how that's working for us right now. Um, that could change in the future if that obviously goes away. Um, we will probably continue to encourage mask wearing, but we will not be able to enforce it to that level. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we're at. And how are you preparing your drivers to manage conflict and train on de-escalation? It may not be just against them, but maybe two passengers in the back are kind of getting into it because someone removed their mask. Well, for us, I think the main thing is we're communicating that consistent message on the phone at bookings, um, at the expectation when they come up to the bus, um, they're seeing the little decals outside, they're seeing the posters. Um, any creative way we can on social media, we're showing the importance of that. And hopefully this reduces any um, questions about our expectations. Um, next, we view the mask wearing really as part of our safety plan. Um, sort of the no, sure, no shoes mentality, no ride. You know what I mean? It's actually, it's policy. Um, and it's part of our safety policy and it applies to everyone, both drivers and riders unless they have a real medical necessity uh, to not have a face covering. And in those cases, we, we, we often supply face shields in that case. I mean, we provide face masks as well. Um, we don't give a lot of them out, believe it or not, because most people are complying. But um, we want to give the other passengers the highest level of reinsurance, you know, reassurance that, that we're providing them a safe ride. So whenever possible, we too have been very fortunate that our local career development center made some face shields on their 3D printers. And then they were able to supply us with some until we could get them. And we have been able to distribute those when necessary for folks who have breathing difficulties. And then, you know, finally, um, drivers are really encouraged to offer really concise and, you know, information about policy, not really getting into it with passengers, you know, try to de-escalate the situation as much as possible. Thank you. Has anyone on our panel had any issues with staff or riders simply saying that they don't believe in COVID-19? I know we've heard a lot of no masks, no ride, but maybe more on the driver's end, has that been an issue? Well, we, we've had it on passenger ends. My office is very fortunate that we are sort of the hub of Vermont's complaint department. Um, <laughs> and we have several very outspoken riders who um, believe it's a conspiracy and all the other shenanigans. Um, we've also had riders who have taken their mask off after they've gotten to their appointment on the way home and refused to put it back on. So these are things that do happen and probably will happen more and more as we get ridership increases. Um, so it, it can be a challenge, but I think it's important to you know, just be clear um, and let people know that it's for the safety for everyone, you know, and just kind of repeating that message over and over. And I, I'll let Pat talk and I'll stop talking. <laughs> well, one of the, I was just going to add that one of the issues that we ran into was we had a lot of fear of the COVID from some of our drivers. So we actually had three people, well, actually two that retired uh, once COVID. Uh, they, just, they just couldn't take it, they, the fear of it. And then we had some issues where some people just, they just had anxiety. So we had to pull them off the bus. But it wasn't that they wouldn't wear the mask or the PPE. They just didn't like the idea. Even when we put the barriers up, uh, there were some issues with the glare. I heard you talk about that, Jim, and I want to know how you guys are. I know we had a question about that for you, about the glare with the little, um, you talked about the, um, it's something like a, a shield that you're pulling across or something. It's, over the barrier and I was wondering how you're dealing with that because that was something else we wanted to add and 
one of the some of the feet that we got from some other vendors was that there's a bad glare at night so i was just curious about that one so you know when you get when you start talking hopefully you will uh, address that one too because even with the barriers we still had some fear uh among some of the drivers and so we did um have two to go ahead and retire yeah so i guess very quickly we did have a couple of our drivers also retire they're of the age where they would have been close anyway it became an opportunity for yeah. them to move on um shower curtains i think is what you're referring to yeah. um so you know we install them in a way like you know regular shower curtain works it's you pull it fully open when passengers are boarding and then you know op open up the shower curtain once they're boarded so that the drivers weren't having to try to look through the shower curtains while driving um you know in terms of uh drivers who don't believe um I can only share one story, which was shared by the public transit administrator for Vermont. Um, we have weekly calls with them. Uh, everybody around Vermont has weekly calls with the, the public transit administrator. He said he'd gotten a report one morning that a rider had said a driver of some other system, not mine, thank goodness, was talking with passengers and basically espousing that, you know, that driver didn't believe in it and wasn't going to enforce masks and this, that, and the other thing. And our transit ministry was very clear that if that happened, they expected there would be a performance issue and that funding could be put at risk. It was not acceptable, it was not okay. So the message got through very quickly. You know, people can have their own personal beliefs, but in Vermont, it's a law that people wear masks and that's the expectation. And uh, it's unacceptable for somebody to be um, expressing opinions counter to that. While on duty anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. All right. So finally, let's wrap up with reopening and safety. These are the final comments. I know that not everyone system closed or was even heavily modified. Some stayed almost a little regular. But as the phases kind of come to pass and the states begin to open up, how will you adapt? How will you modify? And what does reopening look like for you? And I'm very interested to know what happens when the states of emergency are over for your states and has your system tackled that issue yet? Yep. So I just, I don't want to dominate, but um, you know, we're, we're grappling with those questions right now. One of them is just, you know, what do we do with remote workers? Do we bring them back? Do we not bring them back? I mean, I think, you know, school systems are dealing with this, other businesses. So, you know, we have to think about um, all these things. In my mind, um, the, the keys are that, you know, there are sort of four primary things. There's social distancing, there is mask wearing, there is um, hand washing, and there's just general sanitizing. If we continue those protocols and continue to communicate those protocols, I think that staff will feel safe. I think that riders will feel safe. And I think that's really, really important. Um, you know, I, I, Transit is a safety business from, you know, pre-COVID. It's just a new version of how do you keep people safe. You know, there's expectations of riders before that drivers use um, turn signals, that drivers stop at stop signs, that drivers don't speed. You know, we'd have to monitor and enforce those actions. These are just going to be a new set of protocols. But I, I would say, you know, in the roughly three months that this has been going on, you're starting to see people become more normalized to these activities. And I think that will um, play out. But it's, it's going to continue to be a work in progress. Um, you know, I, I think broadly it comes down to what are the protocols and those are being more and more well defined and, and refined. And then there's the monitoring enforcement part. And I think that's the trickiest part, especially when you have, you know, these buses, these volunteer drivers out there on their own, but those were always tricky in the first place anyway. So um, it, it's a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of work, but I think it just is going to have to be reiteration over and over and over. Thank you. Pat, you had something to note? Yeah, I just wanted to say that in Georgia and, and in Athens right now, what we're looking at is this is the norm. We're going to continue to social distancing. We're going to continue to mask because right now there is no vaccine. And we keep seeing the numbers going up, so I don't see how we can say, you know, we'll go back to the way we were anytime soon. Right now, um, our um, depart, our, our managers, our city managers are saying, let's keep the, let this stay the norm until uh, 21, to the year 21 or 22. And so uh, that's just the way they're looking at it because of the vaccine. There's no vaccine yet. So, you know, that's just where we are right now. Thank you. 
Yeah, we're looking at at the same situations. You know, how do you move forward? Um, our stay at home order was lifted um, this past week um, for a good share of our area. Well, for the whole state, really. Um, there are still some restrictions on some businesses that aren't open. Um, but so we're starting to see re-engagement of passengers um, more and more over the last couple of weeks. Um, so the discussion with our board, you know, has to be how long do, do we maintain this? And we'll take a lot of uh, direction from our local health departments and, and continue to follow what the state guidelines are and, um, of course, CDC. So um, I think the biggest thing is going to be the, we're going to see complacency, you know, from the general public. They, they feel like, especially in our area, because we've only had 16 positive cases in our county, um, yet a county 30 miles to our east has had over 100 cases and 10 deaths. Um, you know, just in, in a 30 mile distance. Um, how do we, how do we enforce the, the use of the masks and um, when people are becoming complacent and, and thinking everything is back to normal when we know that that's not the case when you sit in on health department calls and, and listen to, to the science. So um, it's going to be it's going to be difficult, I think, in a way, um, but we're going to have to find a way to to impress on folks that, you know, this is going to become our new normal. And if you want to utilize the transit system, you know, just like other rules that have been in place on, on transits in the past, whether it's no eating and drinking or on the bus or, or whatever, you know, the rule may be, um, this is a, a new rule. And if if you want to utilize our, our services, you know, this is what you have to do to, to be able to utilize them. So um, I, I think we've got a, a tough road ahead of us as far as um, how, we, how we deal with things over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, you know, it, it's definitely not gonna be uh, business as usual. It's gonna be, um, this is the time for agencies to, to really revamp and rework. If, if you found things that weren't working for you, um, now's the time to, to make those changes while, while things are restarting and, and you've got the opportunity to do it. So that's what we're looking at. We just finished a, a five-year master plan. And so this actually gives us a great chance to make some of those changes that we were talking about because we've, you know, essentially... Uh, lost 90% of, of our ridership over the last three months. So now we can re-engage with, with these new routes as we start to move forward, um, but continue to maintain the, the protocols in place, the social distancing and such. Thank you and thank you all. We have ran out of time with all of these fabulous questions. As we promised, every little nugget that we said that we were gonna get over to the attendees, I promise you that we will. In addition to that, we have a, a variety of resources here. And one that may be very interesting for those on this session is the COVID-19 Buyer's Guide. So please do check that out. That's on our CTAA resource page, which you can find at the top of our homepage. So with that, I will turn it over to Taylor. Thank you guys so much. Wow, I think I speak for everyone about what an amazing session that was. The questions were fantastic and I really appreciate all the great insight you guys offered. So we are going to begin our next session at 2.15 Eastern time, so in seven minutes. That session is all about funding and financing for the future. So if you can navigate to your email inbox, go ahead and click access link for CTAA's finance session and we will see you in seven minutes. Thanks everyone. All right. Thank you.